Hello and welcome to my channel. I'm going to tell you about my September VHF contest. CQ, 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 this is Kilo Echo 4, Whiskey Mike Foxtrot. Roger, Roger, you are blasting into the state of Ohio, 59 plus one. Welcome back and thanks for being here. My name is Scott, call sign KE4WMF Rover during the September VHF contest. I have rebuilt the tower on the car. I My goal was weight savings and maybe just better functionality as well. And so it turns out that what I did helped me to create something that loads faster. It's more sturdy, I think. It's it's very sturdy and maybe even more aerodynamic. I, I averaged 20, over 26 miles to the gallon. With the other setup, I was getting less, so I, I think I've achieved some aerodynamics here. I've removed the loops from my setup. I, I just don't need both loops and Yagi's on the car for these VHF contests. Now that I've got more experience and I've developed an operating practice, it, I just don't need it. So I think I have a good setup. My practice, yeah, I could probably still use some uh, some tweaking. But anyway, let me go back to that. So the beginning, I got everything all set up, ready to go. There was a ham fest slash tailgate of sorts in Richmond, Virginia, uh, the morning of the Saturday, what was it, the 13th. And so I decided that I would go to that ham fest, uh, meet up with some of my fellow club members. There was another rover who he wasn't roving for that contest because he was selling some stuff at the ham fest but i decided i would meet him in person as well and then that visit turned out to be a little bit more of an exhibition of the car than i thought it would be and, and that's okay i was there for a couple of hours and because i left at 11 and the contest didn't begin until 2 i had all kinds of time to wander out to an area that i didn't think that i was going to visit and this is in the blue ridge mountains on skyline drive a lot of people at east are familiar with that drive and it's a long road to drive for a contest it's a huge time suck but i was able to drive in a little ways and there's a few scenic overlooks and i had made up my mind which overlook i think i wanted back when I was an inexperienced contester. And so I chose the one that looks east because back in the time I thought, yeah, I would be contacting people back home. And I forgot that my method had changed. So I was at the wrong overlook because the one that I should have been at is the one that looks north because from me, most of the people that I make contact with are to my north. So I chose the wrong overlook. I still did okay. I think I might have made enough contacts there to activate Shenandoah National Park. I'm going to include them as a Parks on the Air activation. And then uh, from there, I, I drove. I was behind my schedule now because Skyline Drive is two hours out of my way compared to my regular schedule because it's an hour out and an hour back. But then I dropped off one of my other operating positions. My joke for uh, Saturday evening was at this point... I probably have put more dollars into my fuel tank than contacts into my log. And uh, that I think was true at the time. But now I'm looking and I have, uh, after I guess I had a very good Sunday, 140 contacts all told. And I did not put $140 into my fuel tank. I think maybe 75. This car, it's probably one of the more expensive to operate rovers because it requires premium unleaded. I got the car before I got into roving and I'm not getting rid of the car just because I have new radio activity. So I'm running what I've brung. That's just the way it's going to be. So uh, yes. So 140 contacts. I operated from, I'm going to show you my log here, just the front of it anyway. And you can see that I have 38 contacts on six meters. Six meters was not really very active. Uh, two meters, 64, and uh, one and a quarter, which is, uh, I just call it the 222 band. It just rolls off the tongue better. I made 19 contacts on that band. When I look at the score statistics, uh, total contacts was 140, but then my QSO points, because the contacts that are on 222 and 432 are worth more than the ones on the lower bands. And uh, multipliers, I think those come from operating 
to or from different grids. And so I operated in, I think, seven grids. And uh, my total score, if this is correct, and I don't have duplicates, I'm sure I have at least one or two duplicates in there, uh, but 8,188. And that's that's not bad, especially when considering how, gosh, voice, it just there was just nothing there. Hardly even really any band openings on FT8 on six meters. Two meters really came to life Sunday evening, which was last night. To my surprise, if I talk about my history with the 222 band, when I first started as a limited rover, I only ran three bands. Now, I couldn't enter as a three-band operator because I was entering as a rover. And so the lightest class that I can operate as a rover in is limited rover, which is four bands. So basically, I was running three bands and losing any opportunities that I could have made in the 222 band. My logic at the time was, hey, you know what? If I get enough people asking me, hey, Scott, do you have 222? Then I'll start looking at getting a 222 rig. And my first couple of contests, yeah, I, I didn't get asked a question. I just wasn't getting a lot of success. Most of it my fault, I'm sure. And then there just came a point. Hey, Scott, you got 222? So then I got a uh, 222 megahertz FM rig, and it was all right. The, the radio just kind of sucked. I didn't like it. I could hardly wait to get my hands on a transverter and use it with the FT-857. And that has been magic. I think it finally was ready to go and in service for the June VHF contest. I made 19 contacts. One or two of them had told me, it's like, dude, your, your 222 signal is the strongest one. And this is somebody way up in Connecticut. <laughs> strongest signal out of the 222 radio. And I got to say, I really like 222. Somebody had told me that that was their favorite band because it has similar propagation properties to two meters, but the clarity of 432. And I agree. The key takeaway, don't delay on 222. And I would even say, don't even mess with getting a, an FM rig. Just get the transverter and put 10 meters into it, 222 out. I really like the 222 band. I, I have to agree. <laughs> It's, it might be the best kept secret for us. You might have noticed when I was giving you the, the quick shot of the um, antenna setup, all four of my verticals. Now that I have four Yagis on the roof, they are a collision hazard. All of the antennas are a collision hazard except for the Wii Boost. But I have replaced all four of my mounts with K9000 motorized mounts. Totally unnecessary, but totally fun too. So when I stop someplace and want to rotate the Yagis, I just hit a couple of switches and they all come down. I have them on, on uh, bigger switches that I can, I don't have to focus so hard on pushing the soft touch switches that come with the mounts. And I have them divided into the ATAS and the 222FM antenna. They're both kind of tall. I can put them down separately because sometimes I want to leave the dual bander and the Wii Boost up because sometimes I'm operating someplace where I need to turn on that Wii Boost and pull in uh, an internet signal. And so it's nice to have options. And then when the tower is not up, the motorized mounts will let me get into a parking structure without having to remove my antennas. And so I think that's pretty cool. It's a novelty. It's, uh, it's not smart money spent, but hey, I wanted to do it and there we go. Something else that I wanted to share with you is I have, uh, I have three radios. It used to be difficult to manage the cables that are coming into the computer over here because I used to have like three of them and a USB hub. I had sound card inputs and things. Well, what I've done is I switched to the DigiRig mobiles for the FT-857D and the FT-891. The 891 actually has its own version. I think it's called the DR-891, I think. And so I, then I used my older DigiRig, my original DigiRig, to interface with the 857D. And then I have in the trunk beneath the spare tire, I have the DigiRigs and an RT Systems interface for the ID5100. They're all plugged into this USB hub. And then a single cable comes up here and plugs into the computer. 
You can see I've got a little silver Sharpie spot there, so I always make sure I get the cable into the same port every single time, no change up with the ports. And I have perfect interface with all of this. It is so nice to be able to, well, I've got the rig interface here, right? So let me see, take a look here. It's on two meters right now. And you can see two meters is selected up here. And if I switch to a different band, then it pulls and you can see that it switched up to 70 centimeters. And if I go to six meters, now six meters, I operate from up here, but I will still select six meters down here so that the computer logs my contacts as six meter contacts. Now the trick for uh, 222 is here I will select 10 meters. And of course that doesn't reflect up here, but it still gets logged as a 10 meter contact. I just have to go through and then change all of my 10 meter contacts, 10 meters to 1.25 meters. And then all of the 28 dot anything to 222 dot something and uh, and then that's how I update my log and then it, it all gets updated but that's how I separate all of my log entries and so the rig interface has been fantastic I love it the only thing I have to make sure of is that I only have one program interfacing with radio at a time because it can't talk to two programs at once so when I want to use this program here this one is interfaced with the 857d and so I have to get out of WSJTX for the 857D. Oh, and by the way, when I'm running FT8, I do run two instances of it. So one version of it is talking to the 857 and the other version is talking to the 891. I transmit both at the same time and listen both at the same time. And uh, that pulls quite a bit of power. I, I wanna say it's uh, around 45 amps with the refrigerator going, powering the laptop off a 20 volt power supply, my rotator's turned on. And so it's quite a draw. In fact, uh, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, my battery went dead. It surprised me. I saw every, suddenly everything just went dark. Well, not the computer, cause it's on, it's got an internal battery, but the computer and the fan back here stayed on, but everything else shut off. And I was like, what happened? And then I looked and uh, sure enough, the battery was dead. And that's what happens when you pull 45 amps for uh, extended periods of time. I did not idle the car while I was stopped. I did that during June because it was just so hot. But yesterday or this past weekend, it was very nice. And I could just sit with the window open and a fan going and plenty pleasant. But then start the car and charge it. Even while I'm charging it 400 watts, when I key down with both of those things at once, uh, two, I got amplifiers in the back, it still would go minus seven. And so seven amps being pulled from the battery, even with the engine running. So uh, it's a slow charge, but I did get recharged by the time I left the Eastern shore and got back to FM 17. Now, I'm not sure where it is. Um, it'll be recharged in no time at all. I'm not too worried about that. That's about all I can think of to pass about the contest. I'm looking forward to uh, to doing more. This seems to be my final setup. I think I'm done. As always, I appreciate you being here. I'll see you next time. Take care.